Well, good morning, Brave Church. Good morning. Say good morning. Good morning. Hey, pastors uh, Jake and Jackie and uh, little Ezra James here. Just want to say good morning. We are back, back to online. Yep. What a wild world we live in. And we're so grateful for those of you who call Brave Church your home. And again, for the grace and patience that you've had for us as we're trying to navigate the best way to move our ministry forward. As I, I spoke about on Friday, um, we decided that it was in the best interest of our church and our community and the wisest use of our resources, our time, our energy um, to go back to an online platform as far as um, our worship and communication. Yeah. Um, we're excited to um, share with you in the next couple of days our plan and what we believe is going to be a little bit more um, conducive for a long-term strategy of how we're getting our community together. Yeah. Um, the thing I love about the church is that we're not restricted to a building. No. We're not restricted to a time frame. No. Um, we're not restricted uh, to uh, any, any real variable um, but rather the church is fluid. The church yeah. is flexible. Yeah. And so um, we love that you're that way. And we're certainly trying to lead that way. Hey, today yeah. um, for uh, this very unique online experience, um, we're going to go back in time to a message that I shared with our church uh, at the end of last year. I think all of us in some way, shape, or form are struggling maybe with a little bit of fear right mm -hmm. now. Uh, maybe you've got some fear for your family health concerns, fear financially. Um, maybe um, you've got fear um, of how you're, you're moving forward. And I want to share a message that I preached last year um, about reframing how we look at the places that we fear the most. As far as our kids' curriculum, uh, Jackie, share a little bit on how people can access those resources. Yeah, you Brave Kids families, you should have received an email on Friday that has the materials for this week, um, just like you have in the past weeks. If you did not receive that email or you would like to, make sure you comment below in the comment section or email us at info at bravechurch.tv so that we can get con you connected to everything Brave Kids. Awesome, awesome. Well, hey, with that, um, let's just pray real quick, and then we're going to dive into the Word of God. Thank you so much, Jesus, um, that you're with us, that you're, you're here in our living rooms and our cars. I pray that you'd speak to us today, that you'll continue to give us discernment how to move forward in the lives that we're meant to live. Enjoy the message. Let's go to Acts 20 here. And uh, this is Paul speaking he's giving some ephesian leaders his travel arrangements and he says and now everyone say now now and now i'm compelled by the spirit i'm going to jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there anyone going somewhere but you don't know what's going to happen to you when you get there anyone going in a direction you wake up maybe your line of employment is you wake up go to work and you don't know what's going to happen paul saying i don't know what's going to happen don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I do know this, that in every city, the Holy Spirit has warned me that prison and hardships are facing me. But here's what he says. This is the King James Version, and I love it so much. This is my theme for this coming year. But none of those things move me. Last week, if you weren't here, check it out on podcast. We talked about what moves us as a church. And today, I want to kind of look at where some of those things will move us through. This message is for anyone that's facing some opposition, and this message is especially for someone who's facing the type of opposition that shows up within. I don't know about you, but the competition, the greatest competition for the life I'm meant to live oftentimes shows up inside me. Anyone else like me? And today I want to talk about where God's moving us and more or less where he's moving us through, and I want to share a message called The Place I Fear the Most the place I fear the most. Again, we are, we are a church that loves community. We love connection. And so I'm gonna challenge you a bit on this next one, especially if this is your first time. I'd love for you to high five five people and I want you to count them. High five five people as you're getting seated and I want you to tell them this, okay? This is what I sometimes have to proclaim on the basketball court. I ain't scared. I ain't scared. Would you high five five people around you and tell them I ain't scared? You can say I'm not if you're, you wanna stay grammatically correct. High five five people around you, tell them I ain't scared, and then you can be seated. Hey, 
And give it up for our worship team and all the rest of our home teams that make moments like this possible. Amen. So thankful for them and, and all that they do every, every single week. Um, so uh, I want to tell you a little about my, about my grandma, uh, uh, a.k.a. Nana. Uh, my grandma was an amazing woman. She was. Unfortunately, um, she passed away last year, and, um, and as we were celebrating her life, we went out to dinner and we reminisced about all the amazing things about my grandma, all the great things. So she was a really amazing woman. Um, and, and as we were reminiscing, the first thing that I thought about that I was just like, man, she was so great because of this, and this is totally something that I thought, you know, as a child, because it's completely surface level, completely selfish-oriented. And I thought, man, I loved Grandma so much because in 1990, to, she gave us one of the greatest Christmas gifts we've ever received. To this day, my grandma and my grandpa still are on like the top five list of best gifts I've ever received because in 1992, that was an important year for, for the U.S. because in that year, she introduced us to the magical world of Super Mario and, and M. Bison and Chun-Li and Caillou and, uh, and uh, Ken, or was it, was it Ryu and Ken, Street Fighter fans, anyone, um, and, and Kirby and Zelda, because on that Christmas Eve, they gave us a SNES, a Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Made her a wonderful woman. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a, my love language is gifts. Um, if, if you're looking to extend some love to me. Um, I remember all the time she'd take us out to eat. Um, her favorite um, restaurant of choice, McDonald's, it was uh, delicious. I love going out to, to eat with Nana because unlike my parents, um, when I was like five, six, she didn't make me order off the kid's menu. And that was a great thing for a kid that loved to eat. She was a great grandma, loved her very much. And it's very important that you know that. It's very important that you know that she was a great grandma. It's very important that you know that I love her and I, I, I miss her very much. It's important that you know that because this next story I'm going to share with you, um, if you didn't know how great she was, this next story might tarnish her reputation entirely, okay? Because my grandma, she was great at a lot of things, but there was one thing that she was not so good at. Of all the amazing things, you know, that she did, there was one thing that she probably could have improved upon, and that was, how do I say this? Um, she wasn't so good at monitoring the movies that my siblings and I watched when we went over to her house. She probably could have, got, she probably could have improved, a little bit of room for improvement there, um, and I don't know if she was lax in her supervision because we didn't tell her how much we loved the Super Nintendo enough. Um, that she was just like, watch whatever you want. Um, but it was pretty much a free-for-all at my grandma's house, at Nana's house, on what my older brother and older sister put up on that TV screen. And this is important because one of those movies that my siblings thought would, would, was a great movie to watch impacted my childhood very, very um, emphatically. Um, I remember I was probably maybe five at the, at the time, and my older sister, older brother, um, they thought, they, they, they recommended this one movie, and they said, this is going to be a great movie. You're going to love this movie. I said, why am I going to love this movie? They said, it's about a toy. And I said, I love toys. I love movies. This makes sense. I said, yeah, you're going to love this movie. You should watch this movie with us because it's all about this toy. The single mom gets her child to make her child happy. This toy that's going to help them and love on them. And 30 minutes into the movie, found out that that toy was not a very nice toy. And 30 minutes in the movie, found out that that was not a children's movie that they, that they put up on the TV screen. Found out that, that it was a movie that really no adult, honest, I don't really even know that any adult should watch that movie, let alone a five-year-old grandma. And, and this is important because after watching that movie about this toy, um, it was a horror flick, I'll give you that much. Um, that, that movie impacted me as a child because immediately that little toy, it followed me around in my dreams almost every single night. And unfortunately, that toy was not any nicer in my dreams. In dream world, it wasn't all of a sudden a good buddy. Just gave it away. Um, it, it wasn't a good friend to me. And I started, I started having nightmares at night and freaking out, and um, I started sleepwalking. And I don't even know if that's related to mom and dad, but I'll say that it is. I'll chalk it up. started sleepwalking as a kid. Um, and, uh, you know, I started sleepwalking so much, in fact, that my parents, true story, had to put a gate on my bedroom door to keep me in my room, which obviously made goodnight kisses awkward. <laughs> Love you. All right, we'll see you in the morning. <laughs> whoop, whoop. 
whoop, whoop. Let us know if you need anything. We'll just be outside the gate. And, uh, and the movie terrified me. I mean, for years. I haven't even seen Toy Story yet, believe it or not. What's Toy Story about? Oh, toys that come a lot. Yeah, I see what happens when that. that yeah, yeah, no, 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 thank you. Uh, it marked me, and, and what, to make matters worse, this is where I'm going. To make matters worse, my older sister, and again, I don't even know if this is factual, but I blame my older sister for most of my, my traumatic experiences as a child, so I'll just stick with that theme. Um, love you, Caitlin. <laughs> Hope Minnesota's treating you well. Um, my older sister found out that there was a store at Mayfair Mall that had a real-life version of this toy. And as a five-year-old, she thought it was pertinent that I also knew that this store had a real-life version of, uh, of this toy. And every time I went to Mayfair Mall, you know who's in there, right? You know who's in there. And, and just like that, the southernmost part of Mayfair Mall became the place that I feared the most. Let me tell you my freedom story, okay? There's the turn. Freedom story. Um, this happened until I was like 12 years old. Until I was about 12 years old, um, my parents decided to take a risk. They, they decided to take a chance, a little parental risk, by, by tr trying to help free me from what I feared. And this is my freedom story, okay? This is just how it worked for me. I want to let you know, this freedom story is a description of how I got freed from my fears, okay? In no way, shape, or form is this a prescription for how to help your kids overcome their fears, okay? So official warning, the technique my parents use is not intended to be recreated or redistributed in any way, shape, or form, okay? Because um, one weekday as a 12-year-old, they said, we're going to Mayfair Mall to go shopping, Found out when we got to Mayfair Mall, they told me, we're not here to shop. They said, the time has come for you to move past your fears. I said, okay. They said, they said the time has come for you to stop sleeping with a gate. You're going to have a girlfriend eventually. It's going to be a hard thing to get over. They said that the time has come for, for you to stare down what has been scaring you for like the last seven years. And they walked me, not really walked me, they dragged me into the store, shielding my eyes so I could not see anything else in that store. It's not a good store. That's why I'm not bringing it up. Um, and they stood next to me as I overcame my fear in the place that I feared the most. And I wouldn't do any of that ever again. I wouldn't wish that on anyone's childhood. I am a strong advocate um, for strict movie monitoring legislation. I really am. But I am thankful for the experience because that experience as a 12-year-old taught me a pretty important life lesson. Because how many of y'all know that in order to move forward, really in any area of your life, it will require you to move through the place that you fear the most. And you can spend your whole life running from all of your fears only to find out that the places that you feared also were jam-packed with a lot of purpose and meaning. That's why I got stuck in Acts chapter 20 because I, I couldn't help but imagine how much Paul must have feared Jerusalem. And I know what some of y'all are thinking, that you go way back with Paul, and you're thinking to yourself, no, not Paul. Paul didn't get afraid. He wasn't afraid about nothing. Not picture-perfect Paul, writer of almost half the New Testament. Not picture-perfect Paul. Not, he was shipwrecked. He was persecuted for sharing the gospel. Not picture-perfect Paul, you know, 20-time winner of the Christian of the Year Award. Not Paul. Yeah, Paul. And it doesn't, it doesn't allude to it in the text. And maybe I'm going on a limb, but I'm going to support some, give some supporting evidence for this. But, but I really think that Jerusalem was the place that Paul would have feared the most. And here's why. Because I found out this last week that Paul, Paul was afraid of things in places that were far less threatening and jeopardizing than Jerusalem. The place where he knew he was going to end up in prison. For instance, I found out in Acts chapter 18 
that when Paul was in the city of Corinth, he had planted a church there. He was preaching and baptizing people in the name of Jesus. I found out that, that in, in Acts chapter 18, it says that, that, that God showed up to Paul in a vision. And he was speaking to Paul. And when he spoke to, to Paul in a vision, the first thing that he told Paul not to do had nothing to do with him being impatient. God didn't show up to Paul and say, hey, listen, you need to be impatient. I've got a plan. You've got to pace yourself. There's a pace to my grace and my plan for your life. Had nothing to do with his patience. Had nothing to do with selfishness. He said, God didn't tell him to not be selfish. It had nothing to do with an anger issue that Paul might have had. I don't know. You read some of the New Testament. God might have been a little ornery. Had nothing to do with his, his anger issues. I, I found out that Paul, Paul was afraid in Corinth because when God showed up in Acts chapter 18, verse 9, nine it says, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in his vision. The first thing that he said to him was, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. In fact, it says here that, that he said, do not be afraid. Keep speaking, Paul. Don't be silent, Paul. And he says this, for I am with you and no one. Someone say no one. Oh, man, I prayed last week that God would gift me with a church that talked back to me when I very, very graciously asked them to talk back to me. Lord, I believe in your pace, and I believe it's going to take some time, but it'll be happen in your name. Somebody say no one. No one. God said, no one's going to attack you. No one's going to harm you because I've got many people in this city. And evidently, Paul, picture perfect Paul, needed to be reminded not to be afraid. And get this, he needed to be reminded not to be afraid in a place where Paul had nothing to fear. Have you ever freaked out about something only to find out that there was nothing to get freaked out about? Blink your eyes if you're with me. Thank you. I, I texted a buddy of mine a couple weeks ago, and I texted him on a Sunday afternoon. I hadn't seen him for a few weeks, and so I just wanted to touch base, see that everything was cool. I text him, say, hey, man, miss you at church today. Hope you're doing well. Hope to see you. You know, maybe I asked him, like, how's it going? A couple hours went by. He didn't text me back. That didn't concern me. I didn't expect that he was going to text me back in a couple hours. I certainly hope people don't expect their pastor to get back to him the exact, in the exact hour that they email me or text me. I didn't, I didn't freak out. But then Sunday evening and Sunday night came and went, and he had not texted me back. I grew afraid. And I know that's embarrassing for me to say, and you guys never struggle with this. But I started to wonder, why on earth wouldn't he text me back? And then I thought to myself, well, it's the weekend. It's busy. Certainly, when he gets back into the flow on Monday morning, he'll text me back. Monday morning came and went. He still didn't text me back. I started to fear even more. I, what, what did I do? What could I have done? Why? Why doesn't he want to text me back? Monday came and went. Tuesday morning came and went. All of a sudden, out of fear, I am texting him yet again. You know that awkward follow-up text? Especially awkward if you trying to talk to someone that you like, trying to get a date. Hey, just wanted to make sure you got my text. And I text him, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, he's going to tell me. He's going to tell me how I hurt him and how the hurt that I inflicted on his life cannot be reconciled or redeemed in any way. And he texted me back, and he said, oh, man, dot, dot, it looks like my text on Sunday didn't go through. And then he screenshotted his text that, for whatever reason, failed to deliver. And, of course, I texted him back and said, that's crazy. I figured it was something like that. <laughs> you ever notice that fear, fear is a great fiction writer. Fear is a great fiction writer. And all it takes is just a little bit of space little bit of delay, little bit of a gap in information and fear, fear will fill that gap with a Stephen King fiction novel. Is your mind like mine? And all it takes is just a little bit of ambiguity. And, and fear, will, fear will write a whole essay on anxiety and why my world is about to fall apart. And all it takes is just a little bit of confusion in my life. And fear will, will write, direct, and produce a two-and-a-half-hour movie full of chaos that rivals, I don't know, any of the, you know, Avengers. Things blow up in those movies. Yeah, something like that. Die Hard, whatever. Tarantino film, whatever. And all it takes is just a little bit of space. 
And I don't know how the fiction that the fear feeds you is, but I know for me the difficulty with the fiction that my fear feeds me, try to say that three times fast, is that the difficult part about it is that the fiction that my fear feeds me is often based on a true story. Anyone with me? The, the difficulty is that oftentimes the fiction that my fear feeds me has some facts intertwined, and that makes it very difficult to discern between reality and really what's probabil- probable and the story that my fear is feeding me. But I found a trick lately. I found out that, that just like it's based on a true story, it reminds me of some of the movies that Jackie and I watch on Netflix. And we'll be watching this movie, and it'll start out, and it'll say, based on a true story. And how many of y'all know that is the trick that movie writers use to suck you in to the plot? Why? Because you're sitting there, the whole movie. Did, that, did this happen? Did that happen? Did, no way. It said it was based on a true story. But Jackie and I, Jackie and I have been finding out that sometimes, sometimes you got to stop the movie halfway through, pause it, get out Google, and do, do any of you do this? I, we do this all the time. Fact check. Fact check. No, there ain't no way. Yeah, it act, no, yep, yep. well, it didn't see what this happened, but then basically the whole story. You know what? There are some fears, and I'm not even talking about faith yet. There are some fears in our lives that you just need a simple fact check. You just need to pause for a second and consider all of the facts. Because what fear does, fear plays on our focus. Fear will, will it's based on a true story. It'll take a few facts and it will, it'll suck in your attention and it'll build a fictional story off of a few facts. And that's what will get you to fear. So my buddy, he doesn't text me. That's a fact. I don't know why he didn't text me. Another fact. But then fear will start to build a fiction novel off of that and say, it must be because your friendship is over. It must be because you're a horrible pastor and you should probably quit your job. But if I just spent maybe just a few seconds and stopped to consider that I've got a, a, a non-responsive text, I don't know, man, I don't, it begins to dawn on me that this is kind of a boring and un, unentertaining fiction story that my fear is feeding me. Some of us, your, your car broke down. You've got a, maybe a bill that, that you don't know how you're going to pay. And the, the fa- fact is, is that you've got a bill. The fact is, is that you don't know how you're going to pay it in that moment. And you start to fear. And fear will start selling you on a fiction about how this is the moment where your life went south. This is the moment where, where your kid's college tuition disappeared. That's what's going to happen. But if you stop for a second and spend 10 minutes looking at your finances, looking at your budgets, you might find that, oh, we can just move some things over here and um, we'll just spend a little bit less on going out to eat next month and oh all of a sudden oh this really isn't that big of a deal at all because there's nothing to fear because you just fact checked your fear out of the situation works really hard to speak that fast (laughs) y'all there's fears like that they just need a good old-fashioned fact check that you you've been fearing but you just need to stop and just think about it Okay, what do we know? That's one of the best things that I've seen in movies. They stop. All right, what do we know? Not do what do we think of of what we know, but what do we know? There's some fears that you can just fact check away. Some other fears, not so much. And we'll get to that in a second. Because Paul had nothing to fear in Corinth. Because God, he God told him that you got nothing to fear here. Nothing's going to happen to you. No one is going to harm you. And God said that I'm with you. The other part that caught me when God was talking to Paul was that God said this. He said, do not be afraid. And he said, keep on speaking. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. And if you notice, God didn't say, don't be afraid and start speaking. He didn't say, don't be afraid, pick up the mic again, get back in the game and start preaching. But rather God said, don't be afraid and keep on speaking, which tells me that even though Paul must have been wrestling with some fears, he didn't keep his calling on pause until he got his fears figured out. That tells me that even though Paul might have been struggling with with some fears, he kept on preaching even while he was afraid. And he never quit on what God had 
called him to do, even though he was wrestling with some fears. This is going to help somebody. Because sometimes you got fears that you can fact check. Others, you need this powerful thing called faith. Because sometimes, if you can't fact check your fear away, sometimes, sometimes you just, you just got to do it by faith. And get this, you just got to do it scared. Somebody say, do it scared. Sometimes, if you can't, if you can't fact check your fears away, sometimes you just got to take your fear, throw it in the back seat, and head in the direction that God's calling you to go anyways. One of my favorite, favorite stories in the, in the, uh, the New Testament is uh, Matthew chapter 28. And it talks about how some women, they went to um, the tomb where Jesus was. But they found out Jesus wasn't there. They rolled up on it. The, the tomb was empty. The stone had been rolled away. There was an angel sitting on top of the stone. And I love what the angel told them. He, he told them what God has been telling man for ever since Joshua, ever since Moses, ever since Abraham, ever since. He's been telling us, don't be afraid. That's what the angel said. Don't be afraid. That's what he said to the women. Don't be afraid. And then he said, Go and tell all the disciples, tell all the disciples what has happened here. Fun fact, I just love this, that the first, first conduits of the gospel were women, that, that the first people that God entrusted the gospel message to women, and I just, we, you know, I'll just, if, we're going to have women up here sharing and just hope that doesn't bother anyone because it's kind of hard for me to get over that the first time that God gave the gospel away, it was women. I thought I'd get some applause from the women's side. Thank you. But what I love was what happened next because in, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 8, it says that they did, they left, they departed quickly, that they ran. But this is the part that cracked me up. Right after he told them not to be afraid, don't be afraid. Somebody say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He said, don't be afraid and go tell them what happened here. In verse 8, it says, so they departed quickly, they ran. But this is the funny part. It says that they ran with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. They ran to share the gospel, but they ran with fear and joy. They ran with fear and joy. Somebody say run with it. So sometimes if you can't get rid of your fear, you just got to run with it, y'all. And that's the power of faith. That's the, that's the power of God within you. That sometimes God's answer to our fears is not for us to escape them or even to eradicate them. Sometimes, get this, sometimes the power of God within you is giving you power to overcome your fear. And sometimes you just gotta, you gotta run with it. Sometimes if your fear will not leave you alone, you just gotta put it in a carry-on suitcase and check it at the gate. And I know what some of y'all are thinking. You know the Bible real good. And you're thinking of 1 Timothy and you're saying, you're right, but, but, you know, Paul said it to Timothy. He said, we do not have a spirit of fear, but we have a spirit of, of love and power and self-control. Exactly. Exactly. Paul said that we, we don't have a spirit of, of fear, a, but we have a spirit of power. Paul doesn't say anything about not having feelings of fear. And I think some of us are, 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 are distracted from uh, the spirit that is within us. Because we've got some feelings of fear in our heads. But Paul didn't say anything about feelings. He didn't say anything about emotions. Paul said we don't have a spirit of fear and timidity, which is to say that we might have some feelings of fear, but we don't have to operate out of a spirit of fear. He said, we, he didn't say we don't have feelings. You might have some emotions you might have some feelings of fear that you might just have to experience and endure. But get this, fear is not an operating system that gets to run your life. You might have some feelings, and, and I think that we get this confused sometimes. I think we get this confused when it comes to the life of faith. And this is how I saw it this last week. I, 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 I was thinking about this, and maybe this will make sense. You know, this is the place where I obviously try out things that may not make sense, and I'll learn the following week when people tell me, that didn't really make sense. But let's see if this makes sense. Fear is disagreeable when it's a noun. Fear is uncomfortable. It's annoying when it's a noun. When it's something that you've got. When it's a feeling that you have, when it's a scary thing you're thinking about, when it's a hypothetical scenario that you can't seem to stop getting to rattle off in your brain. It, it is. It's annoying. It's uncomfortable. It's disagreeable when it's a noun. But get this. Fear is deadly when we let it become a verb. When it goes from being a fear that I have to me fearing. When it, when it evolves from a feeling of fear that I'm wrestling with 
to letting fear have its way in my life. When it goes from an emotion of fear that I'm experiencing to allowing fear lead my lives. Get this. The angel told the women at the tomb, he said, do not be afraid. He didn't say don't feel afraid. This is important. He said, he said don't, don't give your identity to your feelings. Don't give your identity. Don't give the trajectory of your life to your fear. But run back. Run back and share the gospel. That's why it was completely possible for them to run back, do what God had called them to do, but still have some fears along the way. God said to Paul, he said, do not be afraid, but keep on speaking. Keep on preaching. I believe that God is speaking to some of us because he's saying, listen, you might feel afraid, but don't be afraid. Don't let fear define your life. Keep on going. You might feel afraid, but don't be afraid. Keep on moving forward. You might be afraid as a parent because the fact is, is that you don't know exactly what you're doing. And you don't know whether it's really working. And you're not sure about yourself as a parent. But God's saying, don't, you might feel that way. And that might feel fearful. But don't be afraid. Keep on loving your kids. Keep on leading your family the best way. Now, how? You might be afraid because you don't know where the next job is going to come from. And you've heard no a lot of times. And, and you're uncertain about that. And that's making you feel pretty fearful. But, but God's saying, don't be afraid. Don't give your fear to that. Keep on sending out the applications. Keep on showing up to the interviews. Some of us have a future that's scaring us, and there's some scary stuff in our future, but God's saying, listen, don't be afraid, and don't give your fear access to your calendar. Don't, don't you let fear give, give a voice to your financial matters. Don't you let fear speak over your life, speak over your family, or speak over your calling. We get this, I get this confused a lot because I think that I have to be fearless in order to be faithful. Anyone else like that? And, I, and I'm, I, God's called me and he's moving me and I'm thinking, well, if I could just, you know, get this whole fear thing taken care of, then, then, then I will. You notice that Paul said, and now I'm going, and now I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem. One of the ways that fear shows up is procrastination. Well, we're just pushing it off. And, and if you're like me, it's never, it's not that you say I'm never going to do it, but you want to know what we say? I'll do it tomorrow. And yet Paul says, and now I'm going. He wasn't waiting for his fears to subside. I've been finding out that, that being faithful and moving forward really has nothing to do with being fearless. Here's what it has to do with. It has to do with giving fear less of our attention, less of our focus, less of, our, of influence, less decision-making power in our lives. This is a good time. It's a little too quiet in this place. It's a good, it's a good time to praise God. That we don't have to be fearless. Somebody say, I'm not fearless. Now, now say this, I'm just brave. I'm, it's not that I don't have any fears. I'm just choosing to let God lead my life. It's not that I don't have any anxiety. I'm just not letting that take the steering wheel. That's the power of faith. Jerusalem would have been the place that Paul feared the most because Corinth was a place that really he shouldn't have been fearing at all. Jerusalem had some things to be fearful of, and I bet that's true of us. Some where you're like, now the facts are there. There's some things to be scared of, and that's what Jerusalem would have been. That's why I, my hypothesis is that it was the place that he feared the most because he didn't know what was going to happen there. That freaks us out. Number two, the only things that he did know about was that he was going to prison and that he was going to be persecuted. I don't know. I'd freak out. Jerusalem would have been the, the place that he feared the most. It was uncertain ending, certainty of hardship and physical pain. And yet there's some irony to Jerusalem too. Do you want to know what the irony about Jerusalem is? Do we have a few minutes? Can I tell you? Can I just tell you a little bit of fun fact about Jerusalem? The fun fact about Jerusalem is that Jerusalem was not always a place that Paul would have feared. It wouldn't have been. But in fact, Jerusalem, Jerusalem wasn't always a place that would have been life-threatening to him. In fact, prior to meeting Jesus, before meeting Jesus, the resurrected Savior, Jerusalem would have been like his comfort zone. Huh. It would have been the main source of his support. Jerusalem was where he grew up as a, as a boy, where he was trained to be a Pharisaic Jew. And Jerusalem where, was where, as an adult... He was, without any opposition or threat to his life, persecuting 
and dragging Christians out of their home and, and killing off the early church. In fact, earlier on in Acts, you should check out Acts. It's a great book. A lot of actions there. A lot of, lot of, lot of good stuff happening on there. In, earlier on in Acts, it says that while the first Christian martyr was being murdered, you want to know who was standing by and nodding in agreement? It was Paul. He was known as Saul at the time. Jerusalem wasn't always a place that he would have feared. Jerusalem wasn't always a place of trouble. Jerusalem wasn't always a, a, a difficulty. But after Paul met Jesus, here God is calling him to go back to Jerusalem, except this time Jerusalem is a place of danger. It's a place of peril. It's a place of prison. It's the place that Paul would have feared the most. Notice the contrast. Before Jesus, it was easy. After Jesus, things got hard. Before Jesus, Jerusalem was easy breezy. There were no, there were no threats, no, no danger. And yet after Jesus, now Jerusalem was full of threats and danger. Before Jesus, there was no opposition. After Jesus, now Jerusalem was full of opposition. Before Jesus, Paul had nothing to fear about Jerusalem. Now, after Jesus, he's got something to fear. Here's a lesson. Don't freak out when fear shows up after you start moving forward. Don't freak out about it. Don't freak out the second that you now surrendered your life to Jesus. Maybe you're one of the people that surrendered your life for the first time last week, and now you're, God, what do you want? Do not be surprised when opposition, when fear, when something scary shows up on your doorstep. Because in the life of faith, I know this is twisted. That's like the giveaway that God's doing something. That, that's like one of the key indications that God's moving in your life. When there's something scary about what God's calling you to do. And that's why I'm not really surprised about Jerusalem. I'm not really surprised that, that Jerusalem, the place of uncertainty, the place of the greatest risk, the place that, that Paul would have feared the most. I'm not surprised that the place that Paul would have feared the most was also the place, as we discovered last week, where God would so powerfully move through Paul. That after going through Jerusalem and being put in prison, it would be because of those situa that situation and, and those circumstances that, that Paul would not only impact his entire generation, but he'd impact us thousands of years later through the little letters that he wrote while he was in prison as a result of being moved by God to go to Jerusalem. The question that I have for you today is, what's the place that you fear the most? And what, what if it's also the place where God means to move you forward through in a way that only he can do? What if while you're waiting for a reroute, God's saying, no, nah, go right at it. What if the place that we fear the most is not a place to run from, but by the spirit of God, the spirit of power. Everyone say power. 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 How do you say this? We want to see God's power in our lives, but we run from opposition, which is the very place where power shows up. We want to see God's manifest glory in our lives, but power, power shows off in problematic places. It shows off in the places that we fear the most. Hey, I hope that that message encouraged you. I hope you enjoyed it and more than enjoying it, I hope that it challenged you. I hope it inspired you to reframe and rethink some of the areas in your life where there is fear. I believe what I said last year. I believe that oftentimes God moves us forward by way of the areas that we fear the most. Hey, um, I would love to just um, wrap up our time together by giving you an opportunity to respond to God's work in your life um, by putting him first in your finances. Thank you to those of you who give regularly to Brave Church through online gifts through bravechurch.tv slash give or through your phone by texting an amount to 84321. Or if you'd like to mail a check, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box Brave Church. I'm sorry, Brave Church, P.O. Box 13754, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53213. We believe that the local church is a worthy investment 
of our finances. And again, I thank you for those of you who do so and help keep moving this ministry forward. With that, thank you so much for tuning into this very unique online experience. Again, I hope that you'll stay tuned over the next few days as we give you a little bit more information on how we're moving forward. Thanks. <music>